Uh, so I would first want to say thank you everyone for joining us. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever in the world that, that you might be. Um, I know that this is a pretty unprecedented time in, in uh, history really, and we really appreciate that you're taking the time to spend an hour with us and, and talk a little bit about digital resources for, for COVID-19 response. <clears throat> um, so like I said, we're gonna take the next hour to talk about the resources that Damagi has on hand for, for your response to COVID-19. Um, over the past couple of weeks, Damagi has been working with a number of organizations and governments to develop um, both templated uh, solutions for, for mobile apps for COVID-19, as well as some more customized um, work. And we'll be reviewing, uh, reviewing that. And I think our, our main goal here is to ensure that if you think your organization or government could um, benefit from uh, a digital tool in your response to COVID-19, we wanna make sure that Damagi is supporting you in that. And so to that effort, uh, a lot of the, the things you see today are gonna be uh, freely available and open to anyone responding to COVID-19. So that includes both the, the template apps that uh, Aaron Quinn will be walking us through, um, as well as a number of other resources, including pro bono subscriptions to CompCare, which is our mobile application development platform. So we'll talk all about that um, over the next hour. Real quickly, I want to introduce you to the folks uh, who are joining us today. Um, we've got four folks from Damagi joining from all around the world, actually. Uh, on the left there, that's, that's me. That's, uh, my name is Marshall Daly. I'm the Director of User Engagement here at Damagi, and I'm going to be moderating the discussion today. Um, up next, uh, to the right of my headshot there is Aaron Quinn. Aaron leads our customer success team here at Damagi, um, focusing on ComCare. Uh, so she makes sure that everyone using the platform is, is ready to rock and roll, and she'll be taking us through the template application that we've built uh, for COVID-19 response. We also have Marissa Harrison. Uh, she is a project manager here at Damagi. She joins us from California, actually. Um, and we're really grateful that she got up so early for this. Uh, thank you, Marissa. And she's been working with um, uh, state governments here in the United States, actually, uh, to develop a, some digital solutions for their COVID-19 response. So she'll talk us through um, and demo a little bit of, of those uh, solutions. And then uh, last but certainly not least, we have Jillian Javetsky. She's chief of staff here at Damagi. Uh, she's been leading Damagi's overall response and, uh, and support for, for organizations and, and governments uh, responding to COVID-19. And she'll be on hand for um, everything really, but uh, specifically to answer any questions you might have about the, the resources we have on offer. And uh, real quick, run you through the agenda and we'll hop right into it. So uh, first and foremost, we wanna introduce you all to the Compare platform, specifically how it can be used for outbreak response. Um, and then we also wanna uh, demonstrate the capabilities of those free template applications that, that I mentioned before. We'll also share a little bit about how Damagi has been working with uh, governments so far in their response to the pandemic um, and talk about the custom solutions that, that we have on offer. And lastly, we'll save a little time at the end for a Q&A discussion with our panelists. So really importantly to anyone uh, joining, if you have a question at any time, go ahead and submit it in the Q&A box. So at the, the bottom right of, of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little Q&A button. Hit that, it'll pop up a window and, and submit your questions at any time. Uh, so without further ado, I want to hand the mic over to Erin Quinn. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Marshall, and welcome, everyone. Um, I would just echo Marshall's statements. Thank you guys for taking some time out um, to talk with us today. We know that we have um, an audience of people who have really different interactions with Damagi and ComCare. Um, some of you have probably been working with us for five or ten years. And some of you, um, this might be the first time you've heard the words Damagi or ComCare. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit of an overview, um, a bit about Damagi, a bit about ComCare, and then specifically um, give you some information about our tools for outbreak response, um, including the free template application that our team has developed that we would encourage you to go onto our website, copy down, and um, start using as soon as you can. So just a small bit about Damagi. Um, our mission is really to create innovative digital tools to um, drive sustainable impact. And particularly, we focus on low resource settings and on underserved populations. Um, I think it's interesting, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, work happening across the globe right now with COVID-19, including the, the project Marissa is gonna tell you about is actually happening in the United States. So I would say in the, in the context of COVID, 
I would say almost everyone is an underserved population. But um, that's just a little bit about our mission. Um, if you know about us, you know that Calm Care is our platform. Um, it's, it's the tool that, that we've been working with. Um, it's really the world's largest and most powerful um, mobile data collection platform. You can use it to create both mobile and web applications, and it can be used um, by frontline workers for both service delivery and um, data collection, as well as m and &E and a few other use cases. Really importantly, it is designed specifically for use in low resource settings. So in areas where we believe that there might not be consistent uh, mobile data collect, uh, connection or in areas where electricity might not be um, super abundant. So we really have optimized the tool to work in those sorts of situations. Um, you can see this is just a, a graph of, of the form submissions um, in, in Comcare over time. So this is looking at about the last eight years. You can see we've had some pretty exponential growth um, demonstrating how well Comcare can work at scale. Um, we are the largest digital um, platform for frontline workers, and you can see um, we're seeing about 5 million form submissions every day from our cadre of over 700,000 active mobile workers. So um, it, these are just a few ways in which ComCare really can help your um, frontline program. Um, the first way that it can is um, it really empowers end users. So you can build your application to be uh, very, very intuitive and very smart, and it can actually guide your workers um, through all sorts of different scenarios. So if you have a clinical protocol, you can guide them through it. And given um, the, the logic and the different decision making that you can build into your application, you can take a patient's answers and you can spit out different counseling messages or different messages for your user to say, refer this person to a clinic, or this person should be self-isolating or things like that. Um, you can also do things like set a high risk score um, so that your users not only see who's the most high risk, but you could sort their list of patients so high risk people come up top. So there are a whole bunch of ways that you can empower your end users to do the work that they're doing better and do it quicker and more efficiently. Secondly, um, this is very important. You can track data over time. Um, Comcare is one of the only mobile data collection platforms out there that has what we call offline case management, which basically means you can follow up with someone over the course of time over and over um, and, and you don't need data connection to do that. And so, um, of course, in, in the COVID-19 use case, this is super important for us to be able to tracking patients, um, to be able to track the contacts of patients, to be able to track things like laboratory tests and um, patient outcomes. So all of that is really easily done um, in ComCare. I've already said, but of course, ComCare works offline. Um, you do not need signal. You do not need data connection to um, work with ComCare. You can go about your daily business, fill out forms. Um, as and when that user comes back into an area where there is mobile data collection, ComCare will start sending those saved forms to the server. So you really don't have to worry um, about those forms. They, they will start sending on their own. Um, and, and during the course of the day, the mobile worker is never really going to have their um, workflow interrupted if they don't have data connection. And lastly, we think this is important. It's really easy to start small and launch something. You guys could truly just take the, the template application that we've developed and deploy it this afternoon if you wanted to. Um, but you know, assuming that you take this app or you start building your own app and you pilot it and it's working well, it's incredibly easy um, to scale and scale quickly with ComCare, um, which obviously is really important, especially when we're talking um, in, the, in the vein of outbreak response. So I just wanna overview really quickly, how do you actually deploy a ComCare application? The first step is application building. Um, so you'll use our form builder. I'll show you guys the form builder after this when I go in to do the app demo. Um, it is specifically uh, meant for non-software engineers, so you do not have to be a developer to build an app. The four of us on this call, none of us are engineers and all of us have built many, many apps in our lives, so I promise it is, it is uh, possible. And um, for you guys, not only, I mean, app building is, is certainly something you can take our template app and you can, um, you can edit it, you can take things in and out, you can change it, you can build your own things. Um, but you could really take this template app and, and like I said, launch today if you wanted to. So after the app building phase, the next phase is really to deploy this out to a mobile phone or tablet and give it to your frontline workers. 
So once they have um, the device in hand, they'll go around, they'll do the data collection, they'll do any sort of service delivery that your program has, um, and they'll be collecting this data as they go about their day. Again, whether or not they have um, connection is not really an issue as long as they eventually at some point get into an area that has some mobile service. And lastly, when those people, um, when your mobile workers um, send their forms into the server, they'll hit the server and you will have real-time access to view, clean, and analyze those collected data. Um, so this, again, you know, time is really of the essence when we're talking about outbreak response. So even if we're able to get you guys data, you know, 12, 24 hours earlier, I think that's a huge win. So certainly, you know, like I said, as, as your um, frontline workers are collecting this data, you at a more HQ level will be able to log in, view your data exports, view your reports, and see everything as it's happening in real time. And now I think I've, I've talked a lot about kind of the benefits for frontline workers, you know, certainly that we can build them really intuitive tools, tools that help um, them organize their day and walk them through protocol, things like that. Certainly we would expect that beneficiaries also benefit um, from better services. Um, we know that we have some evidence to show that um, the, the quality of visits increase when you have um, a Comcare app in your frontline worker's hand versus a paper tool or something else. But Comcare really is designed for entire systems. So we did just want to tell you a little bit, I assume um, there's probably a lot of you guys who are working um, at implementing organizations and there are so many benefits um, for you all as well as users. Um, we already talked about real-time access to your data exports and reports, that's huge. Um, similarly, there's a whole set of prefabricated um, out-of-the-box reports that you will get on your work, worker performance. So you will actually be able to monitor all of your frontline workers and see who has done what, fill out how many forms, when they've completed them, all sorts of um, information like that. So it makes supervision really, really easy. Um, like I said, it's very easy to use our app building tools. You can download the app that we have um, using the concarehq.org slash COVID-19. That's a link I'll say about 10 more times in the next 15 minutes and we will email it to you as well. You don't have to memorize it. Um, and any changes that you would make to that app, you can remotely update. So you can push out a change. And if all of your mobile workers are in the field, um, they can just uh, grab that update from the server and they don't actually you know, have to come back into the office or anything like that to update their app. And certainly, um, you know, if any of you are here from governments, uh, you can take Comcare data and using our APIs, connect it to pretty much any, um, any larger government database where you wanna feed this data into. Um, certainly, we've had lots of projects that have integrated with DHIS2 um, for government reporting as well. So we really would encourage you to take this data and put it wherever um, you need to for your own local or federal regulations. I did just want to talk shortly about um, Comcare for outbreak response um, specifically. So in 2014, we actually worked in West Africa during the Ebola outbreak. And we worked with 15 different organizations who had uh, vastly different use cases. Um, the use case that I'm, the template app that I'm going to demo to today um, is about surveillance and contact tracing that that was pulled directly from, um, you know, the, the inspiration for that was of course partially our Ebola work and, and also, you know, it's based on WHO protocol. But there are so many other ways that you can use Comcare to support um, your programs. And so, um, you know, of course, we think this can be used both clinically and in communities. You could have, um, you know, nurses or healthcare workers in facilities using this. You could have community health workers using this. Um, typically, Comcare is used in person. That's obviously something that's becoming more and more difficult since we're in an outbreak. So we're also looking at ways that, you know, could you use a Comcare app remotely to do work and, and do data collection? And I think Marissa will touch on that a little bit more um, about some of our SMS capabilities that would allow patients to self-report and do things like that. Um, but really, I mean, you could create an application with behavior change communication messages on self-quarantining, staying home, and hand-washing. You could build out clinical protocol for triaging and diagnosis. Uh, you can track different diagnostics throughout the entire chain and link them to the individual patients. Um, so you actually kind of see that full patient record, which is really important. Um, another thing we've been looking at is working on building out staff's knowledge. So could you do health worker training remotely? Again, in a way that doesn't require you to get 30 people in a room, which we know is really not safe in this current moment. 
So these are just some of the different ways that we've seen people use Calm Care. We would encourage you to think very flexibly about how you can use Calm Care. Um, and, and I would say if you can think of uh, a way that you want your program to be operating, there's probably a way you could build a Calm Care app for it. So just a little bit on the different types of COVID-19 Calm Care projects we have. What I'm going to show you is our free template application. Um, this was based off of a WHO protocol. It's a free application. You can go to concarehq.org slash COVID-19. You can download it right now. We just actually released it in the last week or two. We've already had over 500 downloads. And this application has been adapted for use in Sierra Leone, Togo, and India. Um, it's currently in many languages. Um, more are coming. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But please check it out. Um, it's a great starting point, especially if you are going to do any work around contact tracing. Um, relatedly, we, do, um, off, we are offering pro bono subscriptions for any COVID-19 use cases. So um, if, you, if you really want to start using ComCare, you want to use our template app, we're happy to pro bono you um, and, and, and give you a license for free so that you can do this work as well. Then separately, um, MRSA will be later talking about some of our custom support um, projects that we've been running, specifically one in California. But we do work directly with organizations who have more customized or unique workflows um, that are supporting COVID-19 right now. And so, like I said, um, Marissa will tell you a little bit more about that. And if you're interested in custom support, um, how to get in touch with us. So I wanted to jump right in now um, and tell you a little bit about the um, COVID-19 template apps. I'm actually going to um, let my colleague Jillian give a little bit of um, background information. I'm going to be demoing just one of our template apps today, but I'm going to let her speak um, just for a moment about the different template applications that we also have in development. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, so just to give everyone a little bit of an overview of what we've been up to at Tamagi. So Erin will go into all of our resources that we have available. Um, the summary I just wanted to provide to everyone is that we've received um, some limited, uh, generous, although generous funding um, from uh, some foundations that we're really grateful to, including uh, Johnson & Johnson and the McGovern Foundation to build um, template applications in ComCare that we can share with the world for free uh, downloading and to adapt to your COVID use cases. Um, so, as I mentioned, Erin will go into this. Uh, to date, what we'll be presenting is one um, application we've developed, which is around contact tracing. Uh, so that's, if you look at this slide, there's like different uh, phases of, of COVID-19 that we're all preparing for. Um, one thing that we want to really leverage with ComCare and that we saw was uh, incredibly beneficial during the Ebola uh, response outbreak was being able to not just provide one application for one part of the outbreak, but to provide um, solutions that you can use at different parts, especially as it's, uh, it's changing so quickly. Um, so Marissa will talk about this too when she goes through her use case in California, where we've already seen in projects we're working in, where we're working on an application, they need to tweak it because the outbreak um, has changed. So um, right now we're, we're doing contact tracing. We're, we're hoping um, to quickly deploy as, as fast as we can. We're working around the clock to get these out. But um, uh, other applications for different phases, so that includes uh, for, uh, creating an application for a rapid remote training that we can we can share, um, as well as facility readiness and supply chain. Um, eventually, another area that we're um, looking into is we do anticipate that as the uh, outbreak, outbreak uh, changes for different um, countries as well, that doing home-to-home -home visits will also be less useful. So we're also trying to build SMS capability to do more remote monitoring as well. Um, and that's actually in use right now in the California project that Marissa will be talking about. So. We'll go through this, but this is just to give you an idea of, of sort of what we're thinking about and what we believe are the priorities, but we also want to hear from you of, of sort of what you're envisioning our use cases for your own projects. Great. Thanks so much, Jillian. Um, and as Jillian said, I'm, I'm going to be um, presenting our, our um, template app that's available right now. It's based on the WHO um, first few cases um, protocol. So we've taken this, um, all the forms are, are truly directly from this protocol. It allows you to register suspected and confirmed COVID-19 cases. Um, for anyone that's a confirmed case, you do follow-ups within uh, two and three weeks to record both symptom progression and also outcomes. And really importantly, since it is a contact tracing application, you also register um, close contacts of existing confirmed cases and you can follow up, um, do some lab work with them. And of course, if, they, if any of those contacts become confirmed cases, this whole process starts over and you can um, you know, go through the same sort of workflow with them. Um, 
So this is just an example of kind of the, um, the workflow that, that you're going to see here. You can see someone who starts out as a suspected case um, go through, they go through, they get a lab test, um, they convert into a confirmed COVID case, um, they go through and then, you know, they, they need to get some medical care and then separately we also start tracing their contacts. One thing that I do want to point you down to is the map at your kind of bottom center. Um, we do collect GPS coordinates and so you actually can um, map and, and see exactly where these people are. Um, that was something that we found really, really helpful in um, some of our Ebola work. So I just wanted to point that out to you all. Um, a few more things. We could really talk about this app for hours and hours, and I'm going to try to not talk about it for hours and hours. I'd like to just show it to you. But um, like I said, it's available in four languages right now, English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. And we've got another five coming soon, including a lot of Indian languages. Um, you'll see when I pop you into Form Builder, it's in a very modular template. It's very easy to take out things that you wouldn't want or add in things that you would. So you can really pick and choose what you'd like to take of this application and, and make it your own. And of course, um, you know, since we are implementing the WHO protocol, um, it provides a consistent model for you to be reporting that data and, it, you know, allows you to um, conduct this activity in a way that's in, entirely in line with what the WHO um, recommends. So with that, I'm actually going to take us um, into our form builder. Um, so you'll see here for anyone who hasn't been on ComCare before, this is what our form builder looks like. This is actually um, what the application uh, looks like when you are building it. So if you wanted to come in here and make any changes, this is where you would do it. You would do it here in this form builder. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to demo this to you guys today in what we call live preview. This is um, just an emulator. This is very close to what it looks like on a mobile. It's not exactly the same. Um, those screenshots that I showed you one or two slides ago, that's exactly what it looks like on the mobile. Um, but like I said, this is an emulator. This is also a great tool um, to use for application testing. So if any of you guys are um, uh, working on ComCare, please, you know, we encourage you to use this. Um, I'm going to run through this. The caveat on, on this is that these WHO forms are very, very long. So please bear with me. They were not meant for a quick five, 10 minute demo, but I will do my best um, to go through these. I'm not going to be filling out um, all of the information for every single form just because um, that would take us most of the rest of the call. So bear with me with that. Obviously, if you choose to implement these, please, you know, feel free to actually answer all the questions. Um, so I just press start. I'm logged in as a, a test user. Um, and you'll see here, this is our first menu. You register um, people up here. And then uh, for anyone who's suspected, their forms lie here. Anyone who's a confirmed case are here. And then contact uh, forms are here. So we're going to start out um, by registering someone who is um, a confirmed case. So I'm going to generate an ID. Um, and we're going to call this person Scott. Pearson, and we're going to say that he is a confirmed case. So this is just telling us to, um, you know, that he's going to show up in the confirmed menu, and so that's where we need to go and complete his A1 form. So the first registration form, super simple. Now we need to go in. If he was a suspect, I would go into the suspected list, but he is confirmed. So I'm going to click here. Here you can see this is what we call our case list. So this is a list of all of your patients and some um, information about them. So this is the person's name. This is the unique ID that we've given them. And this is the number of days since their A1 form has been filled out. Um, A1 form is the form that we're about to do with this person. So if we look down here, Scott Pearson's is obviously empty. He hasn't had his, um, his form filled out. So when you click on a patient, then you'll see this is a screen we call the case detail. There's more information about um, the person. This is really great for subsequent visits because if you're a mobile worker, um, before you go to see someone for a follow-up visit, you can actually recall information about your last visit, which just means that you can go in um, much more informed about the sort of things you need to be asking about. You can look at his symptoms from last time. You can look at any um, high risk areas that you think you should be asking about. You can see if he has other comorbidities, anything like that, that's gonna help you give better service. So we've got some patient identifier information. We've got some current status here. And then this just shows what forms have been completed. We obviously haven't completed anything for him yet. 
So these are all of the forms that you can fill out. You can see it's a lot of them. It's this um, initial case reporting, a follow-up, and then a place where we register contacts. Then the rest of these are all um, places where we can um, record test results, or register tests and, and confirm the results. So we're gonna say the current status is of course alive. It's a primary classification case. Um, and then this is just some information about the institution that is actually um, registering the person. So um, I am actually going to skip this screen. No, we'll say that Scott's providing details on his own behalf. Any of the information that we've already um, recorded will fill in. So that's why it's filling in the first and, and last name. Uh, let's fill in his date of birth. Telephone number. Here's some more kind of contact information. Um, so I'm just going to fill this out quickly. Um, ask a little bit about um, occupation. I'm not going to fill that in. Um, a little bit about like ethnicity and um, health centers that they're going to. More about health centers and kind of previous um, health care that they would have gotten. And now it's asking a little bit about symptoms. So I am going to fill some of this out. So we'll say that the first symptom was maybe a week ago. And we did have a fever. We'll say it was a 39 degree fever. And we'll say that the first time he visited a health facility was maybe on Saturday. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is about kind of like the history of other health facilities that they might have done. And this is more about um, other symptoms. I'm going to skip through these. Obviously, you would want to um, fill these out. And these are some lesser known symptoms that kind of show up as this graph to sh say yes or no if you experienced any of those symptoms. Asks a lot now, it's going to ask about, um, again, I'm, I'm not really going to fill most of this, but this is asking about hospitalization, if you needed to come into the ICU, if you needed ventilation, um, if you have acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, renal failure, cardiac failure, um, you know, just a whole bunch of other things that, that might have happened if you were hospitalized or if you have other complications. Um, you guys can see what I'm talking about, about how long this is. Date of discharge, we're going to say not applicable. Um, and we're going to say that this doesn't have an outcome yet because we're just registering. Um, so as of today, we still have no outcome. Um, here's some other comorbidities. So maybe we'll say that this person has diabetes. These obviously are very important to know if there are other, um, you know, extenuating circumstances or conditions the person has. Um, this is just if they've um, contacted an emergency number or hotline. More information about um, visits to primary care or emergency rooms, more information about past hospitalizations. And now we get into a set of questions that's really trying to address um, kind of some of the risk factors. So if they've traveled domestically or internationally, if they've had contact with someone that has COVID-19, they've been to a festival, um, if they've been exposed, where the exposure was, um, if they were admitted to an inpatient or outpatient facility, um, if they've gone to a traditional healer. And then finally, we've reached the end. So I'm gonna say the form was completed. I'm gonna press complete up here. Um, so obviously that was kind of a whirl, whirlwind trip through that first form, but that's how you would um, register fully a new confirmed case. Um, so the next thing that you might wanna do is you might wanna start registering some of the contacts of that case, the, the close contacts that we wanna do contact tracing for. So in the same way, we're gonna go into this confirmed uh, module. We are going to find Scott Pearson again. You can see now on his case detail that we have a little bit more information about him. See that um, his contact information has been updated with what we just um, entered in. His status is also updated as alive. And then his form completion is updated because we just did those forms. Now here we're gonna to wanna to do form B1, which is the initial, um, reporting form for a contact. You obviously will want to fill this out for every contact that the person has. I'm just going to show you one right now. Um, 
And so this is just showing you what's going to happen. A new contact case is going to be created and you're going to be able to view that and do things with it in the contacts menu. Um, this is information about me as the data collector. Um, I'm not going to fill that. And then this is the person's actual information. So we're going to call this Megan Schindler. And we'll say that this is uh, maybe Scott's wife. Gonna be wife. Um, this is just some more demographic information about Megan, um, which I'm not gonna fill in. If you, this is really important. Remember, I was um, talking about mapping and the ability to do that. Um, I'm not gonna be able to do this um, well on the app preview because um, I'm not gonna be able to GPS myself. But if you say you are able to um, get the person's location, you can actually grab the GPS coordinates and then save it. And again, you can actually get the coordinates of all of your contacts and we can produce um, a map report that will show you um, where physically all of your contacts are located. So that's something that I would definitely encourage you guys to use. Um, I'm not going to do that right now just because um, I'm, like I said, on app preview. Um, so some more information about nationality, country of residence, things like that. Now we're getting into these same questions that we saw before about travel domestically, travel, travel internationally, um, contact with confirmed patients, where that would have happened, um, the type of contact. Um, this now is asking specifically about the interaction with um, the confirmed case that you're being registered with. So in Megan's case, this is Scott, her husband. And so um, this is the contact um, when we first knew that the person was symptomatic. So maybe we didn't know he, he was symptomatic until uh, last week. And we'll say, I mean, if it's your husband, I don't know how you calculate this in minutes, but I'll say 300 and um, at home or in the household. And then this is when he was asymptomatic. So let's back this up maybe five days earlier when Scott was asymptomatic but did have COVID. And we'll say 300 minutes again in the home or household. Have we had any respiratory symptoms? We'll say yes, we've had some. Um, and we'll say that we, Megan is currently ill and that the date of first symptom onset was maybe Saturday. Maximum temperature was 39. Sore throat, yes. And we'll say that was from Saturday. And now it's gonna ask more about all of these. Um, again, if you say yes, it has some logic that it's going to pick up and ask you for the, for the date. So I'm gonna say no to these. I'm just gonna skip them through. We have the whole list of symptoms down here. Our status, so we're gonna say still ill. Um, and then we're gonna get the same set of questions about hospitalization and comorbidities. Well, and lastly, we'll write form completed. So now we've gone through and we've successfully met, um, registered Scott, who's a confirmed um, COVID-19 case. And we've also met registered Megan, his wife, um, as a potential case, as a contact. And so um, the one last thing I want to show you is how we would record um, Megan's uh, information. So I'm just going to go in here to contacts and we'll see. Um, what I need to do first is I need to select the confirmed case. So I select Scott, and then I would see a list of all of his contacts. We wouldn't expect that a person would just have one contact. So that's why we make you select the patient first and then um, the contact. And I just, I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna do really quickly um, a virology test for her. Just gonna ask for the lab number. We'll say the sample was collected yesterday and it was received yesterday as well a nasal swab type of test, and we'll say that it was positive for COVID. The result date, we'll say it came today, and we didn't ship any other specimens. So we've now completed this. Um, we, uh, at, this case, at this point, if Megan was a confirmed case, we would wanna start this process over and register her as a COVID-19 case and go through this whole same process with her. But um, hopefully this gives you a little bit of a taste of what this is. Like I said, there's so much more to this application and I know that I zoomed through it, um, but 
we just wanted to give you a flavor of what it's like and, and a flavor of sort of what the workflow is. And we would definitely encourage you to um, come in, look at this on your own. The one last thing I did want to say about it was I wanted to show you guys how you can actually get access to the template app. Um, we'll email this out to you as well, but you just go to comcarehq.org slash COVID-19 and you'll have access to this application and you can um, press import and then you can actually import this application to your own project space. Um, so thank you guys so much for sticking in it with that. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Marissa now who's going to tell you guys a little bit about the custom services um, for COVID-19 work. Great, thanks so much, Erin. Okay, so in addition to the free template application and self-service options that Erin just described, Damagi is also offering pro bono professional services and implementation support for a limited number of projects that might require customized solutions so we have years of experience developing digital technology for infectious disease response and emergency contexts, and we're quickly gaining experience um, using that technology specifically to support the COVID-19 response. And during this time, Damagi staff are available to play a supportive role to organizations. So helping to partners assess how they can use digital tech and analytics, um, coordinating with tech partners to create integrations among different platforms, um, sharing knowledge and best practices and utilizing digital tech in emergency contexts. But we're also able to take a more hands-on approach. So our team is available to help partners customize template applications and utilize some of our other ComCare features and technology like SMS and uh, reporting functionalities. So acknowledging that COVID-19 response protocols are changing really frequently and quickly, we are focused on swift design and rapid iteration with stakeholders. So during our engagements, we gather design requirements, we rapidly develop and test the digital solutions, and we support the rollout of the tool, which includes remote capacity building support for those programs. Um, that would be handing over the tool to a program so they can manage it independently moving forward. Uh, for example, with the support of the CDC, Damagi has been working with Accounting California to digitize some workflows that support case surveillance um, and contact tracing and monitoring of persons under investigation. So in addition to the surveillance features included in the template application that Aaron just showed you, this custom tool also includes automated logic to support screening and triaging protocols and enables patients to self-report symptoms over SMS, um, which decreases the burden on the public health officials to be doing daily monitoring and follow-up over the phone. And it helps to support remote monitoring um, when home visits are no longer possible. So I'll be demonstrating this tool today. I'm going to log in as someone from the case investigation team um, who would be responsible for reporting and following up with confirmed cases, as well as um, tracking and contact tracing. So when I log into this web-based tool, I see a dashboard view of various lists that my patients can fall into. Um, here, we've configured this view based off of protocols discussed with the CDC and the types of patients um, that the public health departments need to follow up with most proactively. So I'll start by registering the new patient. Uh, in this system, we can confirm whether this is a lab confirmed case or a suspected case, as we saw with Aaron's demonstration as well. Uh, if it's a suspected case, we can support some screening and triaging protocols. Um, for example, helping someone to decide whether someone is eligible to receive on site testing at a public health department or clinic. Um, so we can specify whether this person's a healthcare worker, whether they're exhibiting symptoms, um, and based off of your selections and the criteria that this person fits, uh, we can provide recommendations to the user about whether this person is recommended for testing or not. So you see that if they're only exhibiting symptoms, maybe on-site testing isn't required. However, if they also live in a congregate setting uh, where there's a greater risk of exposure to others, then testing could be recommended. But I'm going to register a lab confirmed case for the purposes of this demonstration. We can input some basic details about lab results, which I'll skip past for now. We can enter information about um, the patient's ID, and we can provide some basic details about them. So I'll register someone named Tina Stewart, and I'll enter the case report form to start filling out demographic information about her. So here, some information can be pre-populated. I can also add in notes that I want other team members to be able to see about this case. So for example, um, call Tina, and she's currently self-isolating at home. 
Now the next person that works on this case will see this note about her and be aware that she's self-isolating. We can load in any clinics within your geographic location um, that that patient might be visiting. We can also input additional information about whether this is part of an outbreak and some demographic details as well. So I'll enter this person's date of birth and it will tell me automatically that she's 66 years old. I'll select just a couple of these demographic factors, but I'll mostly skip down to a couple of questions that I want to bring your attention to with regards to how we can build in algorithms that can support triaging workflows. So here we ask a question about whether this person lives or has been in contact with anyone in a congregate setting recently. So that would be someone who lives in a nursing home, a homeless shelter, a dorm, any place where people gather. Uh, if I say yes, and I confirm this person is a resident, an employee, or a frequent visitor of one of those locations, I can specify what type of um, location this is. And this will classify this individual as someone who lives in a congregate setting, which by default means that they are a higher priority case than some others because there's a greater risk of exposure for other people. So if I skip down to the bottom of this form, it will tell me that this person has now been classified as someone who's a confirmed case in a congregate setting. And we can link to external documentation about what to do in the case that you find someone who's a confirmed case in a congregate setting. So I'll submit this form without filling out any additional details, but I do want to just note, we can, all of everything that you see on this page is configurable. We can add and remove questions at will. These are just some of the questions um, that our domestic partners have found helpful. And one other thing that I'll draw your attention to is the GPS capture. So like Aaron mentioned, we can capture the GPS coordinates of a specific location. So for example, if this person lived or worked near UC Berkeley, I could search here and it would automatically bring up the GPS coordinates for that location, which could then be pulled into a map-based report where you could see nodes of each individual who's a confirmed case and where they are, with the goal of visualizing where outbreaks might be occurring. I'll submit. And if I go back to my main menu, I would expect this case, given that I've registered this person as an individual who lives in a congregate setting, to appear in a list of individuals who are in congregate settings. Um, so here I see a list of only those people that live, work, or frequently visit congregate settings. Um, and that way we can triage these cases and send them to the relevant teams who might be working with individuals in these settings specifically. So I'll see my new case that I've registered here, Tina Stewart. Uh, she, I mentioned that she lives in a homeless shelter or encampment, but I didn't enter any additional details about her, so some of her information is blank. To start registering contacts for this individual, I would select this case and like Aaron showed you, you can see details about this person based off of what you've mentioned, including the most recent notes. So you see here my note um, that I called Tina and she's currently self-isolating at home. So if I'm another user who's meant to be following up with individuals in congregate settings, I can see the notes left by previous team members who completed the case report form or interviewed this individual. I'll continue. And to register a new contact, I would click register new contacts which would take me into a form where I can specify how many contacts I wanna register. There's no limit on the number of contacts that you can register for each individual. But for now, I'll just say two. And I'll start with my first one. So I'll say that this is her sister, uh, Marie Stewart. And I'll enter her age instead of her date of birth. Her age is 40, she's female. And I will enter her phone number. As well as the last day that she had contact with this individual. So the date that she was last exposed. I'll say that she was exposed two days ago, but that she's not currently experiencing any symptoms. So she's asymptomatic. And I can confirm that she's willing to receive SMS surveys. Once I do this, this can kick off a remote messaging schedule and a daily monitoring schedule. We can send messages to a person every day for 14 days after their date of exposure, asking them to self-report symptoms, if any, and checking in with them about their condition and their health. We also have the ability to specify the specific times of day that we want these messages to be sent. For the purposes of this demo, I'm going to do 719 exactly so that you can see this message arrive. And maybe I'll give myself an extra minute just to have time to fill out this form. Um, and for the next person, I will say this individual is her husband, James. James is 67, male. 
We don't have his phone number right now. He was exposed today because he lives with her and he is currently experiencing symptoms, which means that now he could be a suspected case. So our system has alerted the user that this person is a potential case because they're symptomatic. Um, and so I'll say that he doesn't want to receive the daily messaging surveys yet. I'll submit. And what I expect to happen at this point is because we've registered James as a potential case, he's going to be both a contact and a suspected individual. So here, if I go back to Tina and I select her case and I click contacts, I can see that we have two contacts registered for Tina here, her sister Marie and her husband James. But I can also see these contacts appear in a list of all contacts. So if I wanna search for a specific contact, I can do so here. For example, I can type in James and that will give me all of the individuals whose names are James. And so I'll see James Stewart here. His case name is Tina. That's the person he was exposed to. And if I go back to see this entire list, you'll see different statuses for these individuals. Some people are pending first contact, meaning you haven't reached out to them yet. Some people are listed as suspected cases because they've reported as symptomatic. And some of them are just being monitored. So monitoring is in progress. So here, James is a, is a suspected case. So um, we expect this case to appear as a contact, but also as a potential PUI or person under investigation. And so we can see here in a list of all suspected cases, James automatically appears in this list as well because he's now a suspected case. And so this would alert the relevant team that follows up with suspected cases and sends them for testing that there's a new individual who was a contact of someone else who is now reported as symptomatic and may need to be tested. And in that way, we can really streamline communication between various teams or members of teams that work in different aspects of this response, including case investigation, triaging, um, and special investigations for people that focus only on cases in congregate settings or people who work in special occupations, as well as that contact tracing element. So now, because I have initiated the messaging schedule for one of my individuals who was asymptomatic, I'm going to jump over to my SMS schedule. So here, this is the phone number that I registered for our patient, Marie. Um, she is the contact of the case that we registered, Tina, and we specify that she is asymptomatic and she was willing to receive daily SMS surveys. So you see here that there's a registration message. You have been registered for COVID daily follow-ups. You will receive an SMS survey each day to respond to. Um, this is just sample text. All of this can be configured by programs depending on the necessary context and language. Um, and all of this can be translated in local languages as well. Uh, so this is her welcome message. We also expect her to start receiving daily SMS surveys. Um, so once that happens, she can start responding to them, saying that she um, has symptoms or does not have any symptoms. So we'll wait one more minute. I specified that we should receive the message at 720. So we see our first message appear. Um, Hello, this is your daily check-in. Please answer the following quick questions. Are you symptomatic? Yes, no. Um, so it asks if they're coughing. I'll say, yes, I am coughing. And then we'll wait one more second for another message to appear, which should ask about the next symptom. Do you have a fever? Okay, I'll say, yes, I do have a fever as well. And because I've responded yes, to one of those symptoms and actually to both of those symptoms, it will ask me if I would like someone to contact me. Um, for the purposes of this demo, I'm responding yes. Um, this can also be an automatic configuration. So if someone re reports a symptom, we can automatically trigger an alert to a team member to say, hey, a contact has now reported as symptomatic and you might need to follow up with them. And to show you what that looks like, if I go over to my inbox, I would expect to receive an email telling me as a team member who's following up with contacts that there's a contact that now be that now may be symptomatic. So you see, I click on this email. It tells me that my contact Marie Stewart, um, who has this phone number, responded to the survey in this manner, that she's coughing, that she has a fever, and that she'd like someone to contact her. Now, I'm sure as a member of the contact tracing team, I am following up with many contacts a day. So we've also enabled a functionality where you can initiate an SMS chat with this pers person remotely. So I can click on this link here and be directed to a window that will show me all of the individuals that have now reported as symptomatic. And I can open a chat window with Marie. 
and I can see my entire conversation history with her. These are all of the, the messages that were sent automatically by her system, as well as her responses. And I can follow up and say, hi, Marie, I noticed that you reported a fever. What's your temperature? And this will help me do some of the triaging remotely to figure out, do I need to follow up with this person or do I not? Um, is she incredibly ill? Is she critically ill? Does she need to be referred to a hospital? What's the situation? But I can also do this with multiple people at once. So I don't have to call each individual. I can be having multiple SMS chat conversations. So now as Marie, I see this message appear. I notice that you've reported fever. What's your temperature? I'll respond, it's 102. And I'll jump back over here. And I see Marie's answer um, pop up. So this could be a real-time SMS chat conversation between you and the various contacts that may have reported as symptomatic to help you identify who needs to be followed up with first. But now if I go back to my application and I sync to get the most recent data, I'm also able to see a list of contacts that are requiring follow-up. Um, so all of the people that may have been, who may now be suspected cases, who may have reported as symptomatic, um, and people that really need to be followed up with immediately. So you see in this list, we have both Marie and James, because James was symptomatic from the outset when I registered him as a contact. But we also have Marie, who's now reported as symptomatic because she responded to the SMS survey that she has symptoms. So in that way, we can alert users um, who may be playing different roles in the system, who may have different responsibilities, um, and may not be able to interact with their other team members um, over voice to go to answer who needs to be followed up with next. We can coordinate those efforts in a single application and in a single coordinated view where people can identify who are the priority cases, um, who was monitoring, who was I monitoring, who now needs to be followed up with in person or over the phone, um, and what is their current status. So in this dashboard view, we can segregate patients based off of statuses, um, based off of the reports from the staff, but also their own reports from remote SMS monitoring surveys. Thank you. I'll now hand the phone back over to Marshall, who will give you more information about how you can contact us if you'd like any of the support. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Marissa and Aaron and everyone. Um, I know we're running a little short on time, um, so we are going to condense the, the Q&A a little bit, but um, for everyone who's been sit submitting questions in the Q&A uh, chat, we'll make sure to follow up with you after the fact. There's some really great questions coming in and we want to make sure that everyone gets them answered. Um, just to reiterate, uh, if you want to get the template apps, um, we'll be sharing out the, those resources in an email later today, but that's going to be at the URL www.comcarehq.org slash COVID-19. Um, you will have to have a Comcare account. Uh, so yeah, you can sign up for that. Uh, that's free. Um, and then you'll have to log in and you can import that template application right into your project space. Um, <clears throat> and then if you're interested in some of the more custom solutions that Marissa had mentioned, um, just go ahead and reach out to us. Uh, the email address is info at demagi.com. Um, we'll share that uh, in an email afterwards as well. Um, so in the just the remaining five minutes, I do want to um, pose a couple of questions. I think. We're getting a lot of chatter around the fact that people would want to customize this template application for their specific use case. I wonder, um, Aaron, maybe you could speak to this of uh, the abilities people would have to uh, to change up that the template app that you showed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, once you go on and you import that application to your project space, you can make any edits that you'd like to to it. So if you'd like to take out some of the questions, you can. If you would like to delete some of the forms, you can. If you would like to add in some new components, you certainly can. And you can do that in two ways. You can either add or delete entire forms, or you can um, you know, go into individual forms that exist and you can delete out certain questions. You can add in certain questions. So there's a huge amount of customizability. Um, I don't necessarily think that we expect anyone to take this template application as is, don't customize it at all and release it. I think we really do want you guys to take it and make it your own and make it work uh, for whatever your local context is. So we would definitely um, encourage you guys to do that. And if you need more help um, on just Comcare app building in general, we have a ton of resources on our help site and we also have the Demagi Academy, um, which has an app building course. So there's a bunch of resources for you guys if you need help with app building as well. 
Yeah, and just reiterate that we're also getting a ton of questions about really specific parts of the template app. Um, uh, thank you so much for asking them. Unfortunately, we don't have time to cover everything, but like Aaron just said, go ahead and download the template and then you can submit those questions directly to us um, in ComCare uh, and, and our support team can help us help you figure out all of that and get you rocking and rolling. Um, another thing that people have been asking for is translations, particularly in French. Um, and uh, Jillian, this might be one for you, but do we have any plans to translate these apps into other languages? Yep, um, so we actually just released a new version um, that now has translations in French, Spanish, Portuguese, and English. So if you go to, um, again, we're going to send out all these resources, so don't worry about memorizing websites. We're going to send you everything. Yeah. Um, but the, the most recent um, version that's that's live and is there it has those translations. Um, uh, the other benefit of Comcare is that um, there is uh, great documentation around how to upload your own languages as well. So if, if there's a language that you are working in that's, that's not on there, um, please feel free to do that. Um, and then the only other language that we, we currently have plans to uh, update in the, we're trying to quickly get those out is Hindi is another one that we're, we're working on. Um, so at the end, uh, it will be translated in five languages and is now in, in four. Thank you, Jillian. Um, we're also seeing a lot of questions about how to use the data that you collect in your ComCare app. Um, I think a lot of people are interested in integrating with other systems, and say maybe they're using Google Sheets, maybe they're using a SQL Server, maybe they're using DHIS2. Um, Aaron uh, or Marissa, uh, would you be able to talk a little bit about how people can actually use the data that they've collected in these, these apps? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a whole bunch of options. Um, native within Comcare is um, a place where you can download exports, so you can get exports in CSV or Excel files, and you can take them directly into Excel. Um, there's also um, native in Comcare, we have an integration with Power BI and Tableau. So if you want to take your um, data there and you want to do some visualizations, it's possible to do that within Comcare. Um, we have our Comcare data export tool, which will help you. Um, it's built around our APIs and it's an easy way to get your data out of Comcare. We also have APIs. So if you have developers that are able to work with those, you can use our APIs. Um, and you can integrate with uh, Zapier, which is kind of... Um, like uh, integration light. So for anyone who's not necessarily a developer, you can use Zapier to integrate with hundreds of other applications, including Google Sheets. There's a bunch, a bunch of different options for you guys to get your data where you need it to be. Yeah, and, and like Jillian said, we'll share out that information in the email afterwards too. Um, also seeing a lot of questions about data security, which I'm really glad that people are asking about that um, and they're concerned with it. I think most importantly, uh, so for example, uh, does a contact tracing app collect identifi identifiable information about an individual? If so, how does this protect people's privacy? I think that's a really important question. And then um, maybe to tag onto that, um, some people are wondering if Comcare is GDPR compliant and HIPAA compliant. Um, one of you guys want to speak to that? Yeah, um, it's both GDPR and HIPAA compliant, so no worries about that. Um, in terms of patient identifiable, uh, like identifiable information, you can see that we do have the fields of name um, in there right now. And so depending on what, what you consider PHI, I think we, we are collecting sensitive information right now. That's certainly something that you could go in and edit. One of the things that we've seen is um, people will collect instead of names, they'll collect an ID and they'll save that as a name. So there's a bunch of options for you to, um, if you're very, very concerned about patient identifiable information, being in the app, you can not make that visible to any users. Um, you do need to think about the usability implications of that. If you don't have people's names in there, um, how are you actually going to identify someone? So if I go to Jillian's, if I'm talking to Jillian on the phone, how do I know to pull up her record? Is the ID that I've given her something that, um, you know, that she'll actually know? So you need to think through that a little bit. Don't just anonymize everything and then have a whole data set that no one knows what to do with. Um, on the data export side, there is a way to mark um, sensitive fields so that when you export them, they are anonymized. So on the export side, we support that really, really well. And then I would just say on the mobile side, think, think about the things that you really need to, to show your users, think about the things you don't, and then you can play around it and edit the app um, to whatever you need that to be. And just, um, just one note to that, like Aaron mentioned before, we built this application intentionally to be like a, a carbon copy of what the World Health Organization's um, first few X cases protocol is for contact tracing. Um, so going back to Aaron's point about like, we're, we're assuming that a lot of people will be modifying their applications so that it like works for their use case, probably to make them a little bit shorter. 
Um, but the reason just like for why there is, um, like for the fields that there are in, in the current applications, because those are fields that the WHO asked for. Um, so again, like there's flexibility with, if you don't feel that you need to follow those exactly to a T, that you can, you can modify those. Yeah, um, thank you for that info. Um, we're at one minute over time, so I think I'm gonna stop us there. Uh, there are a ton of questions that we didn't get to. Um, we will try as best as we can to follow up with everyone after the fact. Um, if we're not getting back to you quickly enough, um, definitely shoot us an email um, and we can answer that uh, directly after this. So I just wanna thank uh, our panelists for joining and then um, also for for everyone else who tuned in from around the world. Uh, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day. Um, we wish you all of the best in your COVID-19 response. And um, please know that Damagi is here to support you in any way we can um, and, uh, and let us know how we can do that. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, we'll follow, be following up later today. Thank you so much. And I, I also thanks just so wanted much. to say that we're gonna like do, we're gonna go through all the questions, we'll answer them, we'll make sure to share them with everyone so that everyone's question is answered in, in some way. Um, and I just wanted to also thank the other um, panelists that were jumping into other people's questions, that's amazing. And I, for us, like we have a really wide network of ComCare implementers and especially during this time when things are so crazy, being able to support each other is a really, really helpful thing. So we'll also share, um, we have a COVID-19 users forum um, for people that are using the template application in case you have questions for each other. Our staff are on there so we can answer questions too. We have lots of like, even like Damagi alumni that are reaching out to help. So we have a huge network that's growing and we think it's only gonna grow more um, as the pandemic progresses to, to support each other. So we're all in this together. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.